Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 4 of Arrow 3261. Today, we're going to be covering shear stresses and shear strains. Now, we've always already looked closely at how members react or structural members react when they're pulled on, when we have a force that's normal or perpendicular to the area. Today, we're going to look at the case when that force is parallel to the area. So perpendicular to the area, parallel to the area. That's called a shear stress. Like it's shearing it off, kind of like an Indian burn where you grab somebody's arm and you do this. That's causing a shearing. Actually, that's causing a twist, but that's a type of shearing stress. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So once again, if we start with that same member, we saw if we have a, say, a square member, loaded with an axial load, we take a cross section perpendicular to the force and calculate our normal stress P over A. But if the force, as in figure B here, uh, is causing a, is, is in the direction, is in the same plane as a cross sectional cut. So if we take a cut through that member and we find that the force is parallel to the area, that's called a shear force. You see that that member is loaded in shear. I'm going to use that word direct shear when we have a really short eccentricity. Now remember from statics, if we have a force at a distance, like a force here right through a point causes no moment, but a force over here away from the point causes a moment about that point. So when we talk about shear in today's lecture, we're going to be calling it a direct shear because we're going to pretend that the eccentricity is so small that there's no real moment. Now, many of the same principles will apply regardless, but uh, since we're not going to be dealing with the moment that develops and the shear stresses that develop due to the moment, we're just going to be looking at that average stress due to the shear. Uh, let's just focus on that. We'll call this direct shear. So when we say when we're dealing with a shear stress, we're still going to be needing a force and we're still going to be needing an area. So, and our stress is still going to be force over area. It's still a stress intensity. And uh, this, what we will define that as is we'll often use a lowercase f because it's a stress. And sometimes we'll use a little subscript s to show that it's a shear stress, although that's kind of optional. Another nomenclature that's most common in undergraduate texts is using a tau for shear stress. You can see both of these throughout industry, a tau and an F with a sub S sometimes, okay? It's just P over A. Now, since it's just P over A, that's an average stress. Once again, it's not a peaking stress. So the real stress distribution throughout the section may be different, but the average stress is this value. When we get into bending moments and shear forces, uh, then we're going to find out that the shear distribution through the section is not uh, is not linear, is not mm, constant. However, uh, the average shear stress will still be this value, and this is still used for many things in aerospace. Okay, these are the units that we have with shear stress, and all we got to do is, as before, figure out our cross-sectional area, determine the force on the section, and then calculate the stress P over A. We'll then go and find the allowable. Now, before, we were looking at normal stresses, and usually we're comparing those to FTU, occasionally to FTY, usually to the ultimate allowable, occasionally to the yield allowable. But since this is a shear stress, we're now going to need a shear allowable. We call that FSU, capital F for, for an allowable stress, S meaning a shear, and U for ultimate. So we'll uh, look at that. We're actually going to get the FSU in the same manner that we got our FTU, FTY, and all those other things from our appendix. This is the factor of safety, which we're not going to be using. This is the margin of safety, which is how the way we're going to evaluate design. For example, if we have a little part like this, a little cantilever beam, we apply this force. Now there's a lot of things going on. And since this force is not applied at the supports, it's not really direct shear. It's actually going to create a moment. And the stress distribution through the section will actually not be constant like this. But as the little distance between our two plates, B and D, get closer and closer, then this because it comes more of a direct shear and this average shear stress P over A becomes closer to the real stress and with uh, not a lot of variation like we'll see when we have a moment building up later. Okay. There's a little picture showing how a bolt shears off once again as you have these two members that are attached with a bolt sliding along each other it causes a bunch of things to happen. We're going to look at some of those 
soon, but one of them is that we're going to get a force trying to pull the bolt in two different directions. And if you take a cross-sectional cut right through it, imagine taking a hacksaw and sawing that thing off and then pulling up and looking at the distribution on the bottom. That's our P over A. For example, imagine we have a fastener holding two things together. We saw it off between and we pull it off between. We find a little round area cut off. It's that P over that A, that's what we're talking about, okay? So uh, let's take a look at this a little further and look at the deflections. So first we're gonna call this, and I'm gonna call this direct shear again. Imagine we have a little thin rectangular piece that's attached to say a wall on the left side and we apply a force at the rightmost end and this little DX and DY are very small, so we're gonna ignore the moment that develops, okay? Because there is a moment, P times this dx is going to cause moment. But if this is really small, that moment will be generally basically negligible. If we pull up on that plate here, that plate is going to deflect like that. Now, it can't move on this boundary, so it just moves like this. And you'll notice we're going to get a little deflection delta y on the rightmost end. And it's going to rotate this little gamma is the rotation of this element. Okay? Now that gamma is what we're actually going to find as our shear strain, that angle of rotation. It's the delta y, so tangent of that gamma is equal to delta y over delta x, right? But if the angle is really small because the deflection is so small, then the tangent of that angle is the same as that angle. So we can say that that gamma is just delta over dx. Okay, we set all this, and we can, we're going to look at this further in just a moment where I'll write those equations out. Now on the second one, we have pure shear. Now imagine this case, this pure shear case, so this leftmost direct shear case occurs if, say, let's say we have a, like a, a rubber, let's say we have a rubber part, say it's a damper or something, and it's bonded to our structure, and then it's bonded to something else, and there's a force like this, then actually this whole thing deflects like that first case in direct shear, okay? Now the second case is kind of like we have a continuous skin, and in that continuous thin skin, we pulled out a small little element, and that's the one that's experiencing shear. Now since this is part of a larger plate, this thing is not rigidly attached to the wall. When you apply a shear, when you have pure shear applied, what happens is you get action-reaction pairs. You'll notice this thing is in equilibrium. If we apply a shear force to the right P, that's going to be reacted by a shear force P on the left end. So this thing is doing like this, action-reaction pairs. However, you'll notice as this thing deforms, as it goes like this, we're also sliding along this. So there's a reaction that develops along that. So while this force, this couple is causing the element to go like this, we're also seeing because this thing is getting longer, we get a resisting force, so we're getting a shear force developing on that face. Now, if you look at this element, you'll notice then that our element has forces along these two edges that are nose to nose, mouth to mouth, those two arrows are together, and on this end down here, uh, same thing, and over here we have feet to feet. Imagine two lovers lying together over a surface and their little mouths are together over here and their little toes are intertwined with over here. And so I could say these shear stresses are very romantic little guys because they're always mouth to mouth, toe to toe. If you just know what one react, what one force on that element is, that tells you all what all the rest of them are. Because if this force is like this, then this one's mouth to mouth. And that means the tail of this is against the tail of another, and the and this was mouth to mouth, so the tail of this is against the tail of another. That sets all of the directions as shown here. Now, as you look at that, you'll notice where with our direct shear, we only moved like this. We didn't, we didn't have the element coming away from the wall, but now because we're out in a continuous piece, we move not only this way, but also this way. So our element gets longer like this. It's getting shorter this way. It's collapsing this way. And it's getting longer this way. You see that? What that means is it's pulling away. We're getting a little angle of rotation here and an angle of rotation here. 
Now, if we want to know, if we're looking at a point and we want to know where these points go to, like this upper right corner, then uh, we're going to need not only the vertical deflection, but also the horizontal deflection. And yet, if we want to look at how much irritation and stress is caused, then we're going to account for both of those strains. So we're going to see that the strain is actually the summation of those. So we're going to call this pure shear. The one on the left we're going to call direct shear. The one on the right we're going to call pure shear. And you'll notice that the moment is perfectly balanced. See this P on the right face times dx causes a moment about the lower left corner. But that moment is perfectly balanced by the P on the upper face times the delta y. We're imagining this is a square element, delta x, delta y, and the force on the right face has to be exactly the same as the force on the left face. The force on the top has to be exactly the same as the force on the bottom. And <clears throat> the stresses are the same. The forces may not be the same. Now, if our element is rectangular, then these two forces, these four forces will all be the same. But if our element, excuse me, if it's square, if it's rectangular, let's say it's wider, then since the shear stress is the same for both of these, then the forces on the faces may be different, but the stresses will be the same, okay? So I'm showing forces here, but really that's causing a stress. And we could just write a little stress on the upper right, a little stress on the lower left. And the forces due to those stresses are going to perfectly balance in this pure shear case. Does that make sense? Okay. We said all this. Make sure you understand this. This is a building block. Actually, a lot of folks get through undergraduate work and do pretty good work later without understanding this. But this sets the foundation for a number of things we're going to do. And if you understand this, it will unlock a lot more of the mysteries of structural analysis for you. So let's look at the strain. We saw this before. We've got our little 2D element, and we're going to apply a little shear force. If we apply this one little shear force, and we keep it attached to the left, we see that this little angle, I already spilled the beans, that this little angle gamma is the shear strain, what we're going to call define as the shear strain. Tangent of that angle is just delta over delta x, and if the angles are small, then that gamma is, the tangent of gamma is equal to gamma. So we can just write that the shear strain gamma is delta over delta x. Now, if we have this pure shear element, we're going to find out, to find the position, we're going to have two tangent, tangent y of gamma 1 and tangent of gamma 2. You can see those. We can write them the same way, which means the total strain is these two added together. So if we have direct shear, so the element only, only rotates uh, in one spot, one direction, then we've got that direct shear case. And if we have a pure shear case where we've got all four cases and the element is able to form, we're going to have to add them both together. This is called the engineering. The engineering shear strain is the summation of those. What we're going to say is the, tan, the tensor strain is each of these independently. Now, when you, if you come back for finite elements and for uh, and or for composites, we're going to find out the tensor strain or these two separate strains, gamma 1 and gamma 2, we'll use both of them. They're half the engineering strain, roughly. The engineering strain is the total strain on the element. Imagine this. Let's say somebody pokes the side of your face kind of hard and you're going, wow, that kind of is bothering me, right? If your total stress is due to the strain caused right there. Now, if that's the only strain being applied to you, then that's the only stress you have. But if some other idiot comes along and starts pushing at this side of your face, your stress is now the summation of the stress happening to the strain over here and the stress due to the strain over here. That's the total stress that you're feeling due to both of those strains. So engineering strain, if we want to understand how irritated our structure gets, we need to add those two mothers together. So we're going to take these two strains. The total strain is going to be that gamma x plus gamma y because that's the strain that is causing irritation in the element, which is causing what we're call, calling stress. Got that? Now, for small angles, this means that these two will both can both be written this way. Got that? Okay. So we talked about pure shear and direct shear. This is our direct shear element. This is our pure shear element. And we saw that the strain for direct shear was this value here. I was kind of getting ahead of us a little bit before. Hopefully now this is starting to feel like deja vu. I think we already discussed this. And yes, I'm starting to understand.
If we have pure shear, we've got to add those two strains together to get the total strain on the element. Got it? Now, if we want to find out where any point is, all we need is that one gamma to locate the point. If we want the position of this, we're going to need both of those. We're going to figure out our X position and our Y position by accounting for each independent strain. But if we want to compare the stresses, if we want to relate the stresses to the strains through Hooke's Law, then we're going to have to account for both. Remember, Hooke's Law, stress equals EE. And for shear elements, it's the stress, the shear stress equal to G times that gamma. We're going to look at that in a minute. Okay? All right. So just to look at tensor notation. So we introduced tensor notation uh, in a first lecture about no for normal stresses. And for shear stresses, this is how we do tensor notation. Remember, the first subscript is the face, the normal of the face. And the second subscript is the direction of the force. So for this first little element, we see on face BH, we have a stress that's on the X face in the Z direction. And since these guys are so romantic, there's going to be on the AH face, we're going to see it's going, that face would be Z, so sigma Z, and in the X direction, and that's got to be head to head. That means those two are coming toward each other. What's not shown here is on the back, we've got two forces, both aimed at the back corner, or two stresses in the same manner. They're locking toes with these two stresses shown here. On our second little figure, we're focused on the, on the face AH. Imagine looking down the z-axis at face AH, and you see these two little shear stresses, sigma in the y, on the y face in the x direction, and sigma in the, on the x face in the y direction. Now, you may be getting confused because you're saying, wait a minute, I thought we used sigma for normal stresses. And that is true that that's very common nomenclature that's used, used near, that's used nearly universally. And for shear stresses, we would often put a tau here instead of a sigma. However, sigma is used as you move on as a generic term for the stress. And the way we know that this is a shear stress is because we look and we see these two subscripts are different. If it was x, x, and y, y, that would mean it's a normal stress on the x face in the normal direction. Since it's an x, y, and a, and a y, x, or x, z, and a z, x, those subscripts are different. That means the face direction is different than the normal, the force direction, and that tips us off that this is a shear stress, even though we're using the subscript, the um, nomenclature of sigma. You got that? Okay. And on the third one, we see sigma yz, sigma xy. Now don't forget these two stresses, even though we're identifying them differently, these are the same. So we just could say that sigma yz, that's equal to sigma xy in magnitude. It just has a different direction. Got that? Now, in order to evaluate these stresses, once we've calculated our shear stresses due to direct shear, we're going to need FSU. That's our ultimate shear allowable. Once again, we're going to go to Appendix E, which looks something like this. This talks about the factor of safety. We've just defined this. All we need is the allowable divided by the stress. We're going to call it FSU, as is shown in this margin of safety equation. So it's the allowable FSU divided by the, by the calculated ultimate shear stress, FS, minus 1. Got that? If you go to our handbook, once again, let's say we have this kind of material, blah, blah. Looks like we got 7075T6. You're going to go find that. It's 071. Oh, we need the T6. That's going to be right here on the left. It's 071 thick. We find our thickness, and we're going to use B basis, and that's the FSU value. It's 48 KSI, 48,000 PSI. Got it? Now, maybe I should have moved this slide up to the front before we started talking about the shear uh, strains, but we saw Hooke's Law for normal stresses. The, sh the normal stress is equal to the modulus times the uh, strain. Now, folks that speak Mandarin will have less trouble with this because what we will say in English is stress equals EE. -E. But it's not EE, -E, it's two different E's. It's like EE, -E, it's two different E's. That one E, E, is our modulus of elasticity. And the other E, epsilon, actually, 
is our strain. So I remember, and many people remember this Hooke's law as stress equals EE, but it's actually EE, two different E's, modulus and strain. Now the corresponding Hooke's law to shear stresses is that the shear stress is equal to the modulus times the shear strain. So shear stress is defined with that tau and shear strain is defined with a gamma and the shear modulus is we're going to use the, the terminology G. So the shear stress equals G gamma. Now you don't actually have to remember this because if you just remember that stress equals EE and then convert all of those to the corresponding shear values, tau equals G gamma, that won't be too hard. We're going to see that G and E are related through Poisson's ratio in a bit. Okay? So once again, this is what the little shear element looks like. We've talked about this. We've seen how it rotates. Okay, now we talked about thermal stresses last time. We talked about thermal strains, or two times ago. We talked about thermal strains. Whenever we have a change in temperature, we're going to get a strain in the part. And if the, if the element is not restrained, there will be no stress associated with the strain. And if the element is restrained, there will be a stress that develops due to the restraint. However, while thermal stresses cause strain in the member, those strains don't distort the member unless something else distorts it. So generally, if we have a homogeneous isotropic unrestrained material, thermal stresses, while they cause normal strains, don't cause any shear strain. And hence, no shear stresses either. Now, if you constrain the structure, then you can develop strains uh, due to secondary effects. Okay. Now, we talked about running loads for normal loads. We saw that the running load is just a force over some distance. Usually, we'd say, hey, we'd be dealing with the, the force on the, on the area B times thickness. And therefore, the running load is just that force divided by that length B. And the stress is just that running load divided by the thickness. That's all for normal stresses. If we have a shear stress, we're going to find the same principle. It's just the force over the distance. So a lot of times for shear forces, we're going to use a capital S to say that's a shear force, just like we use a capital P for a normal force. And uh, that means, and often when we have, well, we'll call a subscript for a normal running load, N sub X or N X X, we're going to cause call a lot of times we'll put this little xy subscript on the on the running load to show that it's a shear running load. We're also going to use the subscript q for shear running loads. Uh, they're called shear flows. So imagine for this element, imagine we have an element and we have a little running force, a little force per inch. So a lot of times we're going to show it like this with little arrows that show that this is a little distributed load along the edge. And we often can call it Q or N X Y saying it's a shear stress. We could use N S also, but often we're going to call it a lowercase Q and this is called a shear flow. A shear flow is the same as a running load. It's a running load in shear. You got that? So make sure you understand this. So this tau can also be Fs, and that running load Nxy is actually the same thing as our Q. We're going to use Q a bit later, both in this and in arrow 3, 2, 7, 1. Okay, so now that's everything we're going to learn about shear forces, stresses, and uh, at least at the moment, and um, strains. However, there's a couple special cases that we ought to deal with. One of them is the idea of this button or fastener loaded in tension. Let's say we have a fastener with a little head like this, and somebody's pulling on it, right? The first thing we got to worry about is that P over A. If we take a section cut with this area, the force is normal P over A, we need to check that against up to you. Then the load runs up the thing. Now in this particular case, we've got 
this thing getting larger as it reaches the button. But if you imagine cutting this off right around the shank, imagine it's a constant shank and we cut it off around it. Imagine what we're going to end up with is we cut it off and we end up with a little area like this, right? See that little area going around it? The length of that area going around here is just the circumference, pi d or 2 pi r. And the width of it is whatever this thickness is. So when we pull on this here, we're going to actually, in addition to the normal stress acting on this face, if it survives that, the load comes up and then it has to come out through this. Imagine a bunch of little shear arrows like this, resisting that. That's the little running load. What's the running load? It's just the force over distance. We have a total force P acting down and the distance that it's acting on actually is the thickness, right? The running load actually, but the little force per unit inch around the circumference is just P over A over the length. This length is the this circumference. So P over pi D is little force per inch this way. And the stress will be that little force divided by this distance divided by this distance. P over pi d t. Does that make sense? It does. The question is really whether you understand that yet. Okay. So our shear stress is just P over A. First, we can look at this head. So we can see that actually we've got this force, P over A on this. And then actually the first little area will be the area closest to the shank, this P over this A. So P over pi dt, that's our first stress. And then if it survives that, it goes out. And then you'll notice right where it's, imagine this button. So first we just verify that it doesn't pull out like this, but the button is sitting on the hole like this, it's sitting like this and it's being yanked through like this. So actually right around the edge of the hole, you get another shear stress, p over that pi d and its thickness, right? Where the buttons, not only is the, is this thing being pulled out of it right in the middle, but the button is being pulled through. So we're going to have a normal stress right down here. We're first going to have P over this little circular area here, P over A. That's our tension stress, P over A. We check that against FTU. Then we come up here, right where it reaches the thing, and that little area is this pi d t is the area. So p over pi d t is the shear stress. And then if it survives that, you can take a circle around out here. And that's what it looks like over here. And you can see this pi d t, right? P over that is the shear stress out that. So if you, we look down on this thing, let's, let's say let's look up at the thing like this. We're going to see this little thing with a little force coming at us. We're going to have a little shear stress right around here that tries to pull it out. And then at the edge of the hole, we're going to have another shear stress around that guy. Okay. Then if you look at this thing, we actually have this. Now there's a hole out here and you'll notice part of this and then this is being pulled this way. All of this inside this is not restrained. It's actually being pulled through the hole. But this part out here can't move. So actually, if we look at the end of it again, here's our hole, here's the circle size. And if we just define this area, you'll notice that area is pressing down on this other structure. So we're going to get another bearing stress. We can say that the stress bearing on the part is going to be this area minus this area. So it's pi times big D squared over 2 squared minus little d over 2 squared. That is the area. So the bearing force is just P over that. You see that? So this kind of could be in our fastener lecture because of shear. I wanted to introduce it here. So this is a circumference length and we talked about all that. Okay. Let's say we have a fastener embedded in the wall. This is analogous. Let's say we have something embedded in a wall like this and somebody's pulling on it. Well, 
well, how does it stay? Well, we do have a normal stress in this P over A, but then we also have around this thing, so let's say it's bonded, let's say it's bonded to it with a adhesive, right? We take the circumference times the, whatever the embedment length, that's the area, P over A, that's a shear because this force is parallel to it. It's perpendicular to this area, but it's parallel to this inner area here. If this is loaded, if this is concrete or adhesive or anything else, we could calculate that shear stress in that manner. Okay, that's what's being shown here. And once again, we have the same stress. And this is just showing uh, if we wanted to figure out how much length we need in order to keep it from yanking out, this would be the way to do that. Okay. So this slide here is just saying, first of all, that the volume, if we have a strained element, then the total volume is going to change. If this was a one by one by one element, then actually we're going to get a little deflection strain times length. And since the length is one, the deflection is just the strain. So the chain, the total length of that is now after loading is one plus that epsilon, since that epsilon times one is actually the deflection. So the volume actually is given by this first equation. It can be arranged to come up with this value E. Now this is not the elongation. This is called the dilatation. It's the change in volume per unit volume. We're actually not going to use that for anything that's used for, for some advanced concepts. But this can be used to find this limit. For many of the materials we're going to use, we're going to find that Poisson's ratio has a minimum value of zero and a maximum value of one half. With most of the materials we're going to use having a uh, Poisson's ratio of about 0.3 to 0.33. Okay? What this slide is doing is a lot of books will go into a lot of detail here. The main thing we need to take away from this is that our modulus is related to our shear modulus. Our normal modulus is a e is related to our shear modulus through the Poisson's ratio. So we can actually calculate E from this, or if we have G and Poisson's ratio, we can calculate G. If we have E and Poisson's ratio, we can have calculate Poisson's ratio if we know E and G. Since our Poisson's ratio doesn't change much, we often, for many materials, you'll find E information. And even if you don't know what the Poisson's ratio is, most of the materials we're going to use are probably about 0.3 or 0.33. You can use either of those values to estimate what G is. Okay, We're not going to have to do this very much because we have our appendix, which is from MMPDS, which actually shows what G, E, and Poisson's ratio are for most of the materials we're going to use. Now, the other idea we have is the idea of shear strain energy. Now, we saw for forces, if we have a force and a deflection in the same direction, that's called energy. In the same way, if we have a shear force and a shear strain, those two are going to be energy. So the shear force and the shear strain, once again, they have to be in the same direction. Our shear force is parallel to the area, as we see here, which shown as a stress. It caused a little gamma, and that gamma causes a deflection, gamma dz, right? So actually, that shear stress times that gamma dz, right? Or the force to the shear stress and that gamma dz, that is our, our uh, energy. And if we're down in the elastic range, we're going to throw this one half in because remember, it's not constant at that value. It's actually ramping up to that value. And that keeps it simple. This is our force. It's just the stress times the area. Our deflection is just gamma dz. You plug all this together. You can write it this way. And inserting Hooke's law, we get this equation. Our, our calculus equation for summing up for a continuous structure and our simplified equation, which basically says, and in this case, we're using V for the shear force. That's another common term, especially when we're talking about shearing of beams, transfer shear on beams. We often use V for the shear force. So the energy for a constant section will just be that shear force squared times the length over 2AG. Okay? And if any of those dimensions are A or are L or are G or are V are not constant, we can sum those up either numerically or using this continuous calculus. Let's look at some practice problems. Okay? This little guy, we've got a force. 
and we can see that the force on each face, since this force is going two directions at CD and AB, it's each going to take F over 2, right? That's our shear. And then we can just calculate what is the area of the part. Got it? This puppy looks a little tricky because we haven't covered beams yet. Now, you've done shear and moment diagrams of beams back in statics. Hopefully, you should have. But... Uh, we don't know how to calculate deflections of beams yet. So what we're going to do is imagine the structure is completely rigid. If it's completely rigid, then we can analyze it by summing the, the forces or the moments about point C. We can calculate what P is. We can calculate our stress in that rod. That'd be one check. So let's say, what are we going to check? Well, first, we would sum our moments about C, and we would find out what the magnitude of P is. Then we can go and take a cross section through this rod. It's going to look like this. This P over that area is going to be a tension stress, which we compare to FTU, right? Also, we'll see this P. And if we take a cross, any cross section through this part, if we draw what those cross sections look like, whatever they are, calculate the area, then we can get the shear stress that any of those section cuts. Now, once again here, we can see the shear diagram on this. It's going to be shear and then more shear and then all that shear comes out. So this is the shear in the part, V. And if we take a cross section anywhere, we would take, just take the shear stress would just be whatever the shear force is in the member divided by the corresponding area of that section cut. Then we could look at this little rod. We're actually going to do this later and we see this rod is going to react that. We'll actually do that when we get to fasteners. But these are some of the strength checks that we can make already with what we know so far. Okay? Here's another little example. This is kind of like that eraser example I showed you. Now you'll notice we have two plates. They're bonded to this rubber piece. Uh, we aren't actually told what the, I guess we are, uh, we aren't told the thickness of the plates, but it doesn't matter because those plates are rigid compared to this soft rubber core. So if somebody pulls on the upper plate with a force P, that's going to cause, imagine as that moves like this, what we're seeing is a stress. If we have this plate up here and it's being pulled this way, what happens is it's sitting on this structure here. So this structure here is reacting. So underneath here, we're going to, I'm going to draw it right here, but actually underneath here, we get the shear flow or shear stress along here that's resisting that. And this is all on the underside, right? So actually we get a resistive force like this, which means it's causing like this. We have the rubber piece like this. Our rubber piece is going to be loaded like this. Now, because there's nothing over here, this is not pure shear. We can't develop a shear force there. So this is what we'd call direct shear. This force here, this P, has to come straight down through here and be reacted down here. So actually, the shear stress is just P over A. What A? It's the area of this, which in this case is 2.5 times 8. Okay? And if we take a section cut down here, because it's a constant section, it's the same. Our shear stress doesn't change from up here to down here. It's the same value as the shear works through the part. If we look at this, if we break this piece up into a lot of little tiny pieces, we saw this upper plate was pulled this way. It's reacted by shear stress that develops, which means it applies here, which means it reacts here, which means it applies here, reacts, applies, reacts, applies, reacts, until we get down to the bottom. Meanwhile, because we have this shear, if we look at the edge of this thing, we've got this shear occurring like this. What that means is this thing is going to deform like this. Whoops. Like this. And we could look at this little angle of deflection, gamma. Right? What is that angle of deflection? It's just this little change in length, right? divided by this little original length. So actually, if this is 2, and we know that this is 0.04, then our gamma is just 0.04 over 2. It's actually the tangent of that, right? Or the arc tangent of that. But since this is a small angle, if we imagine that small angle is small, then actually that gamma is roughly equal to this. And that's what we'll do. Does that make sense?
So that's what we're going to see on this guy here. And we'll go ahead and solve it with Beer and Johnson. Blah, blah, blah. Make sense? Okay, you are now armed and dangerous. This is how we analyze your stresses. Remember, if the force is normal to the area, it's a normal force, causes a normal stress. If it's parallel to the area, it's a shear force causing a shear stress. We know about tensor notation. We know how to calculate shear stresses. We know how to calculate shear strains. We know the difference between direct shear and pure shear and we understand how to calculate the strains gamma due to the deflections either for pure or direct shear. We also know how to get our allowables and we can write our margins of safety against those allowables. These fundamentals will be used over and over and over again throughout the structural structure sequence in aerospace and in industry. Do yourself a favor, master it now. Do the homework, practice, practice, practice. Enjoy.